All right, today we have a special guest, a, a U.S.-China specialist, Jeremiah Anthony tracks the developments in U.S.-China relationship, its nuances, shortcomings, and opportunities. Jeremiah, Bri uh, Jeremiah brings experience in from USAID, the United States Senate, and various NGOs. He has advised Transparency International and the United Nations, among or other organizations. He has a master's degree in law and diplomacy from Tufts University, a certificate in conflict resolution from the Strauss Institute, and a bachelor's of art in history from Pepperdine University. He is a Jefferson Award recipient for his NGO leadership and work. Welcome to The Bridge, Jeremiah. Well, thanks for having me. I'm really excited about this conversation. I, I mean, I think a lot of people want to learn about you firstly. So uh, you're you live in Colorado now, but I know you travel all over the world. I was listening to your conversations when we were together in Fujian. Um, can you tell us where you grew up? Yeah, I grew up in uh, a small little town called Iowa City in Iowa in the U.S. Um, it's a fun little college town. It's where the University of Iowa is. I didn't go there, but uh, it's a great little town. You know, the only thing I know about Iowa is that's where Captain Kirk from Star Trek, the character, grew up. <laughs> yeah, I think just 10 minutes north of where I lived in Iowa City, in, a, in an even smaller town. And I'm saying something called Riverside. There's a Riverside in California, too. There's actually one near where I, I grew up in a place called right. Oakdale, California. Okay, uh, so I wanted to know about your first trip to China because the last trip to China that you had, I guess, unless you've gone then since we met each other, was this year in 2024. But you mentioned that you had come several times before. Uh, you'd mentioned 2016 specifically, but when did you first start coming to China? First time I ever went to China was 2016, uh, January of 2016, and I came for uh, a study abroad. We had some classes in our own little uh, sort of house, kind of, or our own campus. And then we also took classes at Fudan University in Shanghai. Well, that's a prestigious university. Could you tell us about what your experience was like? Was it, it what you expected? Was it different? And if so, how? I, I think it exceeded my expectations in every single way. I was, I was going to think about, um, you know, what in particular was my expectation of China going in. Um, and all I can remember is before 2016, before the first time I went to China, I thought, this is such a big country and there are so many people here. Um, because I remember, I think it was a high school geography class where they overlaid a map of China uh, over Europe. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, it's massive. Um, like I, I knew China was big, but that really put it into perspective. And so my goal when I went to China for the first time was to visit as many places in China as possible. And I did go, I went to a lot of places, but you know, you, you could spend your whole life in China and not visit all the all the great places the country has to offer. You know, I, I was having a conversation with some Chinese folks the other day, and I was telling them that I've traveled a lot in China. I was naming different places, and they were like, wow, you've been to so many more places than me. My experience as an American is, when I was living in the States, a lot of people who were from other places would come to the States and travel to way more places than I'd ever been. So now yeah. I guess it's my turn to do it here. Because, you know, like, they, oh, have you been to the Grand Canyon? No, I haven't been to the Grand Canyon. Have you been to Las Vegas? Have you been to New York? Have you been to Washington? And all these foreigners, especially from China, are like, oh, I've been to all these places. And I was always confused by that. But now that in China, I want to explore everywhere. It kind of makes sense from the other side of things. Oh, 100%. Um, yeah. May I ask you uh, some of the places you visited? Could you tell us a little bit about uh, one or two places that stood out in your mind? Where would you, I mean, let's let's put it a different way. If you had to help a friend plan a trip, where would you tell them to go? So my favorite city in China is Nanjing. So the conversation starts there. You got to go to Nanjing. I love Nanjing so much um, because uh, for many of the reasons that I, I, I like China, of Nanjing is a city that with one hand really reaches back into Chinese history and human history and world history, but with the other hand really points towards the future. And I think that's also very true of China. Um, the food's great. 
in, in Nanjing, the people are super nice. There are uh, like the really famous museums in Nanjing, but then you can just walk a random street and see a fun little museum, which I think is, is somewhat similar to in America. But in America, a lot of these random museums are in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and what I mean by random museums in America and, and also in China is like the American Museum of Knitting, right? <laughs> And as American, you know, that is not going to be in New York City. That's not going to be in L.A. That's going to be on a random stretch of the highway in the middle of nowhere. Right. But I think Nanjing uh, has a lot of these museums that uh, are, are accessible to a huge population. And I hope more, more people go to those museums, too. And then my other place in China that I would say you have to go to um, is uh, Harbin for the Ice Festival. Sure. It, Super cold, um, but that shouldn't dissuade anyone. And I think that, uh, well, I, I don't really know if people think of a climate for China or Americans, like they don't, they don't think of a climate for China in the sense of, I don't think Americans who haven't been to China before think China is a super warm country or China is a super cold country. Um, the way that we do with other countries like there's many countries that americans and other people rightfully or incorrectly think that's super cold like we think norway is a very cold country or iceland is very cold uh, but i don't know if that's the truth or if that's true for china but i will say harbin in the winter extremely cold but it is so worth it they have these massive ice castles they have uh at least when i went a huge I guess you would say slide made out of packed mm -hmm. snow and then uh, a whole other like artistic sculpture competition where it's not buildings per se, but it's just beautiful Chinese characters made out of pure ice and they judge it. It's very nice. You know what I've learned about the uh, Harbin Nice Festival is that each year they try to outdo themselves for the previous year. So if you get to go in the most recent year, for the rest of that year, you can say, I've been to the largest ice festival ever held in the world. <laughs> so that holds true for the for, for at least one year after you go. <laughs> right. And I'm excited to go to China at some point again in the winter or to Harbin again in the winter and uh, and see how far they've come. Because it's mm. been since 2016 for me. Um, yeah. I haven't been there since, unfortunately. But uh, I'm really excited to to, to see that it's veritable skyscrapers now or or something of the sort i think they're holding the um 2024 asian games in harbin this winter that's coming up so for people who are listening and they want to go they will probably stoop it up way beyond normal because china also does these international uh, athletics competitions at massive scale so if the two things are happening at the same time it's going to be insane I, I I think this is probably this winter is probably going to be the best winter for a while. Um, I understand you're something of a linguist. First, let's just start with what languages can you speak? Well, <laughs> uh, I try to speak English, sometimes successfully, <laughs> sometimes not. Um, I, I I I lived in uh, Argentina for a little bit, um, and so I speak arguably Spanish. Some might say, some purists might not say. Uh, I, I speak good Spanish. I speak porteño or uh, like a, a weird type of Spanish. Um, I wish my Chinese was better, put it that way. Um, and those are the big three. But I, gosh, Jason, I just love learning languages. Uh, I feel like they're really the keys to understanding so much of the world because it's nice to... It's nice being an English speaker where a lot of what is happening in the world gets translated for you. I don't mm -hmm. think you know, there's a lot of complexities and, and nuances and, and dialogue and all that around that. But much of what happens in the world gets translated into English sort of by default. But it, there's some sort of beauty in understanding or talking to someone in their native tongue uh, mm. that especially the first time you say something in their language. And I, I, don't, I, I think every time I've tried to say something in another person's language uh, or seen it happen, 
they get this little expression on their face of, oh, I get to be really understood. And, you know, there's all sorts of backstories about that of, of you know, perhaps they're a migrant in America or whatever country you're in. And this is the first time that they've heard uh, their home tongue being spoken. It's really fun. Uh, I have so much to say about that, but uh, yeah, I, I, I want to learn all the languages. I don't think I'll have enough time. Well, I mean, I think all, <laughs> I don't think that's possible. There's like 5,000 languages, but you know, yeah. maybe the six official languages in Hindi or something, you know, the big ones, that would be yeah. like, that's a lifetime. If you just, just tried to learn those seven languages, it's your entire life devoted to learning languages. I mean, which sounds right. wonderful, actually. It's just also really hard. Because, you know, yep. the jump from English to French or Spanish, not that big of a jump. But jumping into, like, you know, Arabic or Chinese from English, it's a tough jump. It's it's not yep. that easy, actually. I think I, some people I know are like, oh, it was nothing to learn Chinese. And for me, I'm like, what are you talking about? It, it's so hard. Okay. I'm going to, you know, I also think it's really interesting. We have AI now, so you can just translate anything now. Like I have CapCut, which is the software that uh, TikTok uses, has a function now for paying users where you can actually just do your video, record a five minute video or 10 minute video of yourself or whatever. And it will automatically produce a translation on the bottom or actually change your voice to produce, make it look like you're speaking in a different language. I'm sure there are tons of grammatical errors but it's just such a fascinating time to be alive um we met in fujian at the china u.s uh youth festival and uh, i wanted to know from your perspective from the last time that you've been in china to now and i asked you this question then but i'm gonna ask you again now what do you think has changed in china because you know you had visited china a few years apart what did you notice was different because china they have something called china speed right like where the development's happening pretty quick right um well i definitely saw the china speed in action of it seemed like everything had changed everything had uh, advanced and what we talked about when we were in fujian is specifically the upi the um the contactless payments the phone the phone payments like alipay right. ration um, and that was so remarkable to me because I've seen similar technology in India. I would like to see similar technology in just, just around the world because I think it's really useful. Um, but I was astounded by how used it was. You could go to essentially anyone. I, I don't really recall encountering anyone who didn't take the phone payments. And I think that just makes for a much more streamlined, uh, more efficient world, more efficient buying process. And you can, it'll, it'll show you, okay, these are all the purchases you've made in the past, however amount of time, which is good for also tracking your finances. You know, that's interesting. I, I also, when I like to point out two different things because, because I think it's such a fascinating thing to talk about. Um, even as early as 2017 or so, there would be these people with um, rickshaws coming in from the countryside into major cities and they sell like tomatoes. That's all they sell. Or they sell like carrots. That's all they sell. And so you go up and you try to buy some. And as early as 2017, they were already like not taking cash. They just have a QR code and you have to scan it to buy whatever they were selling, which I thought was fascinating because, you know, in America is mostly a cash society. But now we have you know, uh, credit cards with, uh, you know, RFIDs in them and stuff. So it's changing there too. But what I really find interesting is it's not everybody. The oldest generation, even though there's public training for them, they, I mean, I'm talking about people in their 80s and 90s here. There's actually usually a line at most grocery stores in China that's just filled with like 90 year olds. And they have like, you know, their little bag that, they're, that they use every day full of uh, vegetables and stuff because they, they typically shop every day for what they're going to eat that day. And they're just standing there with their cash paying in their cash line and everyone else is in the other line. So it's like, you know, it's a little more complicated to use a phone if you're 90, but <laughs> everyone else is doing it. Well, you see that in America, too, of a lot of these digital advancements of uh, tap to pay or Venmo or, you know, those types of newer technologies for payment. There is sort of a line of acceptance. 
in terms of age, right? 90 year olds generally aren't using Face ID or Tap to Pay or Apple Pay or Samsung Pay. You know what? That, that's something that unites the US and China. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask, I mean, I think part of your work is talking about uh, China and the US. So I wanted to ask you, how do regular Americans perceive China in your opinion? And how are some of those perceptions maybe accurate or not accurate? Sure. Um, I think I think this is such an interesting question because China is one of the only countries or one of the main countries that Americans are taught about from a really young age in the sense that young children, young Americans are given books that will talk about foreign countries. And it might not be about a foreign country per se, but it'll have content about other countries. And really, no matter how you slice it or whatever book you're in, uh, they'll talk about China and they'll say, it's this country with a long history. And they'll talk about the Great Wall of China. And sometimes they'll talk about the Terracotta Warriors. And then when you're a little bit older, you learn about other aspects of China. Um, like they have a language that's very different from, from English, where instead of letters, you have characters and it's a tonal language, which is different from American or English. Um, and then you keep on learning more things about China throughout your life. Uh, and there's not many other countries that come to mind where, where Americans are really taught about them, really like throughout their life, and especially from a young age. I think, I think a lot of what Americans are taught about China is very correct of, it is a country with this really rich culture, this long tradition, um, with uh, people who, or, or a country that in its history has invented a lot of great things, gunpowder, fireworks, et cetera, et cetera. So those things are very true. Um, but there's always room for improvement, right? Whenever you're talking about another country, you can't really ever tell the full story. Otherwise, you're talking about 4,000 years in a in a much shorter lifespan. Like the, the human lifespan is way shorter than uh, than 4,000 years or, you know, whatever country you're talking about. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of years. Um, so it, it, there always needs to be improvement, which is why I think there always needs to be dialogue. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you specifically about U.S. media, like news, online media, television media. How do you think, does it fairly represent China in the U.S.? That's a that's an interesting question, too. I think if you're covering a country with a billion people that is a continent sized country, um, you're not going to be able to cover every single story. And especially if you add that you're going to also cover all the news from the rest of the world, too. It's not just oh, you have to cover the news stories of a country with a billion people. It's that if you're a newspaper that's covering stories from China, you're likely covering stories from England, France, South Africa, India, wherever. Um, I would say the U.S. media does a decent job, um, given all of that, of just it's just such a monumental task that only some stories from any country, China, Canada, Mexico, wherever, really makes it to the U.S. papers. And I think if you go to any other country, you're going to find a similar issue of just capacity to print all the stories. Uh, I don't know if this is the New York Times head, or uh, motto anymore. I remember they used to, and maybe they still do, have uh, the motto of all the news that's fit to print. Mm -hmm. Well, if you cover every single story from all around the world or just in China, you're gonna have a really large paper every single day, <laughs> more more than what fits in the paper. Yeah, that, <clears throat> that's a good point. Their Sunday paper, it feels like that sometimes, though. Yeah, <clears throat> it's, it's it's gigantic. Um, you know, one of the things that you focus on is helping ensure that the relationship between the U.S. and China is a positive one, and that it doesn't lead somewhere dark. 
So I wanted to ask you, why is the U.S.-China relationship important and what is at stake? It's so important because almost any way that you slice it, any way you look at it, China and the U.S. are one and two in terms of biggest economies, biggest militaries, et cetera, et cetera. You can go down the line. Right now, uh, I think China and the U.S. are one and two in gold medals at the Olympics and overall medals. Uh, th this might date the the, the interview. Um, <laughs> yes, I mean, things could change, but right now it looks like it's one and two in both categories. But in all other, or not all, but in many other categories, China and, and the U.S. are um, top of the leaderboard, which is why I think it's really important um, because so much is at stake. I, I would say everything is at stake. You have all these existential threats like global warming. That's not something that really cares about borders. That's not something that really cares about uh, headlines. That's not something that cares about anything a lot of humans care about. Um, but the U.S. and China are positioned to do a lot of good in that in that work to fight global warming. And you can go through any other um, issue right now that the that the world is facing, and you could make a pretty strong argument that the U.S. and China uh, could work together to to fight that. Um, I don't think the U.S. and China can do it by themselves for a lot of these issues, but I think that, and I'll talk about this more later, hopefully, is uh, I think they can set a good example for other countries of just not only best practices to work on whatever issue, but also just an example of how to cooperate with each other. There are these two powers that are oftentimes at odds with each other. They, they uh, really don't have the relationship that they should. They should have a much better relationship. Um, but that they are working together for the betterment of humanity. Um, I think they can really galvanize a lot of people and countries around the world. That's a really good point. The, dipl the diplomacy between these two countries could be an example for other nation states to follow. I'd never really thought of it that way. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing that. Um, in your opinion, as someone who's been to China, as someone who studies China somewhat, um, what do you think... What should Americans better understand about China that maybe isn't well understood? I think that Americans really should understand that folks in China aren't all that different from them. Um, they're, you know, I, I hear people joke all the time in the US China space that the the two countries are one and two in terms of KFC Eden, uh, but in actual like important ways, you know, besides the affinity for 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 certain fast food, um, you know, folks in China and folks in America, they want to come home every day, eat a hot meal. They want their their kids to have better lives than them. Um, they want to have fun. They want to, you know, they have their different sports teams they root for and they want that team to win. It's not that different from either country. Um, and I want Americans, I think Americans should also know that uh, people in China are, are really nice and friendly and uh, they have great food. They'll point you to all the good food spots. They'll share their food with you. Um, and uh, it's a great place, great, great place to visit. I mean, at the risk of offending some of my Chinese listeners, we Americans have some pretty damn good food also. <laughs> oh, definitely. I, I'm going to spin the question. I mean, just um, in and out Burger, for example. I mean, just that. Okay. <clears throat> just as one example. I mean, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I want to flip the question. What do you think Chinese folks might, uh, how would they, what would they benefit about knowing about American people that maybe they don't know? Really, basically the same answer as, as what I gave uh, before. But let me add to it. I don't want to cop out. I, I want to give you a, uh, a new answer for this question. I, I, to add to it, I would say the U.S. is a really fun country. Um, there are so many headlines about America and China and that relationship. 
but the people of of the us are really really friendly really welcoming they'll point you to the good food and they'll share the good food with you as well um but the us has so much beauty in it uh in the people in the little interactions that you have every day but also in the nature you go to yosemite zion yellowstone any sorts of those places and you really will quickly forget about all the headlines in the world you really will you'll be looking at old faithful you'll be looking at angels landing you'll be looking at el cap in yosemite and you what a beautiful country this is um what kind you know we went to an activity a youth festival in uh fujian and there are all sorts of other events to bring people together not just between the united states and china but between nations all over the world china's constantly uh, china has a summit for uh, africa the china uh, africa summit in uh, 2024 september 3rd 4th and 5th or, or 4th 5th and 6th this year so what kinds of activities can bring about mutual understanding between the us and china or between any two countries where, where should we be looking to build bridges that maybe we could do more of i think if you especially with the us and china if you look at a problem that is facing the world uh, i've talked about climate change before and many other people have have opined on how the two countries can can work together on that so i won't get too much into that but i think really truly any sort of problem that is facing the world there is a way for the us and china to work together on it um and so i think if you if you start from the question of hey what are what are the problems facing the world you can you can answer it at least to some extent of okay what can the us do about it what can china do about it and what can they do together because the us has has areas that uh, they specialize in that their world leaders in so does china and you know many of those areas are the same right uh, two countries that have excellent uh, biomedical research or you know fighting cancer we can do that we could end cancer forever right i don't know about in our lifetime i don't know about in the, uh, about in the next century but it is feasible like the there is a problem that doesn't really care about boundaries or nationalities or anything like that and we have these two countries who could lead the way show the rest of the world what it means to have really meaningful scientific collaboration on that and go down the line of any other issue and uh and find some sort of similar solution <clears throat> <clears throat> the festival we went to was hosted in China and included about 200 American youth and uh, 500 people participating in total about. Do you see something like that as being politically possible in the United States where the United States would invite 200? It didn't it doesn't necessarily have to be students, 200 scientists from China or 200 uh, diplomats from China or 200 you know, I don't know, singers from China, <laughs> whatever it is, could there be that kind of collaboration on U.S. soil where Chinese and U.S. counterparts to get to get together en masse to have a positive sort of festival or summit? Oh, easily, without a question. I think that not only is it possible, but and I can't remember the specific names, but the U.S. has hosted uh, similar events before. Um, It'll be everything from Chinese young people who are interested in basketball coming and uh, participating in summer camps with U.S. youth or or with pros from the NBA or Chinese singers, Chinese artists. Um, there's a whole range of events that the U.S. has hosted before and can host again, and I think they should. Um. In terms of, you know, when we talked about people-to-people -people exchanges, most people think about university students, diplomats, and business persons. Sure. <clears throat> but do you, do you think that there are other, what other categories would be most useful? Because obviously university students, they're future leaders, and yeah. diplomats are leaders, and business persons need to get along in order to 
I mean, I think business is the foundation for Sino-U.S. relations, honestly. Before we had Blinken come over, Yellen come over, we had Tim Cook and Elon Musk. So it seems like business is, in a, in a way, being better at diplomacy for the United States and China than our actual political diplomats. So what are good areas of uh, overlap or leader? Like what kind of leaders or what kind of people should we be pushing together? The first one that really came into mind for me was artists, because you have this really rich tradition in China and in the U.S. of great artists. And you can talk about writers. You can talk about movies. You can go down through any genre of art. And uh, China has some really great ones. And so does the U.S. And I think it really benefits both countries if artists come and talk to each other. Uh, Chinese filmmakers and American filmmakers comparing notes, uh, painters, et cetera, et cetera, or even, even going into, I wouldn't say this is the most pressing problem for, for humanity, but I think having art more accessible for more people. Uh, I don't think it's an existential threat per se, but I think it really helps this thing we call humankind if there's more artistic dialogue and more people looking at paintings, sculptures, whatnot, and uh, and creating their own art, right? Like we, we, you mentioned a little bit, the university students are leaders of tomorrow. Well, there could be some guy in middle of nowhere America or middle of nowhere China who sees art, right? At a museum or some sort of traveling show and they become the next great artist. And mm. we shouldn't cheat ourselves out of that. I actually live next to a place called the International Sculpture Park here in Beijing. And it's art from all over the world, all of these sculptures uh, from artists from pretty much any country you can think of. And it's it's fascinating to just walk around and see different perceptions of like how to see the world. <clears throat> also just a great place to go walking. So China, uh, since Xi Jinping's visit to San Francisco, has set upon the task of inviting 50,000 American students to visit or study in China to help create the conditions for mutual understanding. And um, well, actually, you, you know, you mentioned leaders of tomorrow. I think that's better put than the way I, I phrased it. I think that's a really interesting idea. You know, it, you know, older generations tip, typically seem to be set in their ways more. They have set about establishing their uh, perceptions of the world, their political beliefs, students are really looking for answers. I mean, that's what their job, their job, when you're a student, your job is literally, literally to look for answers. So do you think that increasing uh, students in China and Chinese students in the US, because there's been a slight decline over the last five or six years, um, could be a suitable way to increase mutual understanding between our two countries? And if so, why? I think there, are, yeah, I think there, it would be more than suitable. It's it's one of the best ways to develop mutual understanding. Um, but I don't even, I don't even know where to begin on why, because it's, it's almost easier to say why not at that point, right? Of, of picking reasons why it wouldn't be. And frankly, there aren't that many. I think just at the very base level, having more discussions, just having more people, regardless of whether they're students or any other uh, profession or, or occupation, is useful. Just having 50,000 Americans in China learning about China and sharing aspects of American culture is really useful to both countries. And then having whatever, whatever increase in uh, Chinese students in America is also useful for the exact same reasons of just building some sort of understanding of how the people of each country are. Because uh, I was lucky enough, as you mentioned, to study in China. Then I've also met many Chinese students who are in America. And really the big learning uh, from both of those is that Chinese people are great, that our cultures have so many similarities, and that it is a benefit to both countries to learn from each other. Um, just even the casual conversations, it doesn't even have to be a symposium or a speech or anything very formal, but just those, and this is sort of like an English expression, I guess, the hallway conversations of right. walking between rooms and you just start small talk with uh, 
with your uh, Chinese colleagues or colleagues from whatever country, and you learn something new. They'll they'll drop a little bit of a nugget uh, of wisdom on you, uh, and that could be <clears throat> even life changing stuff. Like uh, I've I've been in conversations before where an American colleague of mine found out about washing rice uh, from a Chinese colleague. You know, washing rice before you cook it. They hadn't oh. heard about rice. <laughs> I was they like, what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But just rinsing it before cooking it. And uh, he told me later, this has changed his whole perception on rice. <laughs> I think a good thing, right? Um, but then even going into the future leaders of tomorrow aspect of people being able to say, I, I've been to China. I, I understand to some extent China. Uh, or I've been to America and I understand to some extent Amer to, to some extent the American way of thinking or American culture um, and being able to to make decisions with I won't say educated but more educated more you know more context um, I think that's a that's a benefit to us all I want to throw in a couple questions that I didn't prepare you for <clears throat> so you've been to India extensively I, I know from talking to you in Fujian India is essentially, very probably, the next China to rise in a multipolar world. Its GDP yeah. is growing extraordinarily fast, and no one really can tell what its development path is going to look like, but it's definitely going to be a very strong pole. I think, in a way, we're looking at China now because it's reached the same heights as the United States in many ways. And so it's like, okay, now we need to really understand China a lot better. But if we could do it over again, maybe we should have started our path to uh, developing uh, diplomacy better at an earlier stage. So is there an opportunity, based on what we've learned about China's rise, to begin to learn about and understand India better, not just as Americans, but also Chinese and other poles around the world, as it is beginning its ascent to becoming a very major uh, power in the world? I think some ways, yes, some ways, no. Uh, I think China and India are two very different countries, and um, there are a lot of similarities, uh, but they are two different countries, and there's two different really contexts of their rise. Of China's rise started, what, at least in the American mind, people sort of categorize it as 30 years ago or 20 years ago. That's when you saw like a, a real upswell of China, and you know. People will kind of disagree with the exact year, uh, but we're around then we can we can call it in the neighborhood of that. Uh, and so that's more post Cold War. And then India's rise is the backdrop is among many other things, this us China relationship. You can also talk about uh, conflicts in the Middle East, uh, a, a different situation in in South Asia. I mean, even today, there's a new government in a South Asian country uh, that, right, that might have huge consequences for India's rise or even India-US relations. I think there are ways that we can learn from it, though, um, or from China's rise and how both China handled it and how America handled it. Um, I think so often global discourse, not just Western discourse, has been focused on a, a single hegemon paradigm, whether it's the US or uh, previously the United Kingdom, et cetera, um, or this dipole situation where you have the USSR on one hand and, and US on the other. And sometimes that gets overlaid on US and China right now. I don't think there's as much conversation about if there's three countries or even more. I mean, there's India right now, but you have many other countries that are really coming up too, as well, like Nigeria, Indonesia, Brazil. There's a there's a lot of countries that are the next India or the next China, right? And I don't think the world really talks about that that much. Uh, you, not in the U.S not in China, not in India, not anywhere really. Um, I think it's too soon to tell. Mm, mm. 
<clears throat> you used to work in the U.S. Senate in some capacity, and I was wondering on a political level, is there, are there, well, let me rephrase the question. There are less students, fewer students uh, from, the, from China uh, going to the United States to study. Um, yep. I think part of that might be there was an uptick in anti-Asian uh, hate crimes in the United States over the last few years. Um, what can the United States do to make universities in the United States more attractive again? Universities have to be able to, to say to China, say to India, say to all the countries that send many of their best and brightest over that we're open for business again and you're going to get uh, a great experience here. That our research facilities uh, are top notch, that uh, we will educate you and you um, will have a good time in the classroom and out of, out of the classroom. But more than that, I think there needs to be a bigger push on you're going to be an asset to the campus, to the college of your experiences in China or in India or wherever um, will make our campus communities stronger, but it will also help advance whatever field that you're in. Um, that if you are in, I don't, I don't know, meteorology, right? Or if you're studying biology or history or whatever subject, you bring in experiences just like anyone else that will help you as a student, but will also help whatever discipline that you're in. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned earlier climate change doesn't care about borders. And uh, I think, in my opinion, my humble opinion, that in order to facilitate um, better and more dialogue between the United States and China, we need to cooperate on internationally uh, important issues like climate change. So is work on transnational issues of importance to create better dialogue between the United States and China or just any global partners for that matter? 100%, yeah, with US and China and with any global partners. And I think also if the US and China work together on issues that are not even necessarily global problems, but are issues that are cause for concern in both countries uh, or uh, even on like a smaller subset of countries, I think that is also, uh, you know, beneficial for the U.S.-China relationship, and for, for things like things like reversing glacial melt, right? That's not something that impacts many countries, but that is an issue in China. That's an issue in America, and that's you know I understand that's a subset of climate change. Um, there's many other issues that are either not really global issues or are specifically issues that people in America and people in China both care about. I mean, on that um, topic, uh, it does seem that China is leading the global transition towards green energy technology, which I think is surprising for me and a lot of Americans because we were talking about doing that in the 1980s. So like now China is actually scaling all of these technologies up and, and installing them at home. I believe Yale University said uh, maybe a couple weeks ago that China has installed as much solar and wind, no, it was twice as much solar and wind as the rest of the world combined. So uh, you, the United States obviously needs this technology too. I mean, maybe some of the business interests like the big oil they don't want that. But for the rest of us, it makes a lot of sense to have a much greener energy grid, especially with AI taking off. We need enormous amounts of energy added to, you know, our energy infrastructure, our portfolio in the United States. But it also seems like <clears throat> the United States is avoiding importing technologies from China that would help us do that. And what, how can we get uh, leaders in the United States to maybe JV more, you know, have joint ventures with Chinese companies or import more, or what is the right way for the United States to go and why has it chosen uh, not to participate so deeply with China? I think not even specific to the US, but just standard practice for all people is you have to let curiosity win. 
you have to let friendship win. Uh, you can't let fear or uncertainty add your judgment. Um, the stakes are too big. I mean, global warming, we've said it three or four times, it does not care about these lines in the sand we've put, right? It, it does not care about if you're from Italy or if you're from India. The stakes are too big. America and all other countries um, should adopt more green technology, uh, find other ways besides just solar panels and wind and you know different energy sources to be kinder to the planet. Recycle more, right? There's there's a whole smorgasbord of 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 things that all countries can do, and I think you just have to remember what's at stake. You know, it does seem that our economic interdependence has been a balancing tool for our relationship. Because a few years ago, people were talking about decoupling. Very quickly, people realized that wasn't possible. So how can economic interdependence be a tool for maintaining peace? So many ways. But one of the ones I really want to talk about is just having the contact. Just American and Chinese enterprises meeting face to face or on video call um, and being able to discuss business. And sometimes that means also having those little hallway conversations. Sometimes that means having real points of disagreement and trying to address them, uh, whether that's disagreements on the particular business deal or operation in, in, in question or if it's on more philosophical levels. It is only to our benefit to have these discussions and to keep on having them and being able to say, you know what, we, we agree on this, we don't agree on this, but we can, we can solve or we can address that disagreement at a later date. That I trust you to be a good faith actor and I hope you trust me as well to be one too. You know, actually, I have an idea based on what you keep saying about hallway conversations. <clears throat> you know, those uh, I think everyone listening knows those uh, dating uh, uh, apparatus where you show up and you have like a five minute date and then you move and you have a five minute date and you have a five minute and they just keep switching partners throughout the night. Maybe you get some phone numbers. Maybe you don't. It's a tool that they use. It's uh, they have this in Beijing. Also, it's not yep. just in the United States, in the West. It would be really interesting to do a uh, a forum a dialogue between whatever actors we're talking about, youth, for example, and where they just do that, where it's not for dating, but it's about, you know, maybe you, maybe it's not just China and the U.S. You have people from all kinds of different countries, you know, like 50, 100 countries represented, and you just switch and you ask each other, you know, you have some questions in a card or you can make up your own, and you just ask people about their culture for five or 10 minutes and then switch. Yep. That would be really fun, actually, I think. I think it would be really nice, and I think it would be very helpful. Um, you know, you're a think tanker, so um, and you're this is your area. I want to ask you, because that my profession is asking questions, what questions should we be asking? I think ceaselessly we need to be asking how can we work together? What can our next next discussion be? Um, how can we uh, try to make the world better, not just for the sake of our relationship? but for the sake of all of humanity. Going back a little bit to your question on, on business, I think there are ways that US and China or Chinese businesses can work together on business between the two countries. But I think there's also ways for US and Chinese businesses to do business with a third party or third country. Um, I think there's ways that the US and China can build their relationship while building up other countries. Well, <clears throat> okay, let me ask you about that because there are a couple of different ways we can go with that, wh where you started. Number one is when the United States puts sanctions or uh, increases tariffs dramatically on some Chinese exports, one of the things that happens is China usually finds a third party country like Vietnam or Mexico and sends unfinished goods to those countries, whether they become finished in the factories there, and then those are, are sent to the United States. It seems like primarily this is costing uh, U.S. consumers because they're paying a hidden tax on tariffs at the border before these uh, items are being shipped into the United States. But the beneficiaries are these third-party countries like Vietnam and Mexico. 
is the fraught relationship benefiting third party countries because it's forcing the logistics supply chain to move through the developing world? I think there have been benefits for third party countries, but in terms of a systematic way of benefiting, I think that's a little bit unclear. I don't think in every situation it benefits third party countries. Mm. Um, but certainly in like the case that you mentioned, it has benefited Vietnam, Mexico, and a couple other countries. Let me ask you a different question. You worked for USAID in some capacity. And, the, and China, and everyone knows they have this uh, program called the Belt and Road Initiative. They also have China, Chinese aid, where they build hospitals and schools and stuff around the world. In the United States, they also build infrastructure. They also send food supplies, notably Doctors Without Borders. I mean, and then we also have a lot of private charitable organizations from the United States who go throughout the developing world and try to help develop. Is there a better way for US and Chinese development in uh, the developing world to complement each other in helping uh, other people up? Definitely. So I've been accused of being uh, an eternal optimist. And I don't think that's true. I'm not an optimist because of, uh, this is, and this will be one example of it. I think there's always going to be ways for the US and China to complement each other uh, or Im improve their, their methods of complementing each other. Um, I don't think the US and China should ever say, okay, we checked off that box, we're done. There's no innovation in how US aid organizations or Chinese aid organizations can complement each other. I think we're really, at an early stage of the US and, and China complementing each other with their aid organizations. And we have so, so far to go on that. This is one area that, in my opinion, it, there needs to be just way more A, conversations between the US and China, but then B, actual action between US and Chinese uh, organizations of, of meeting face to face but then actually saying, okay, you're building the hospital, we're building the school, and we'll work on building the road between them. I, I think that's a really good idea, actually. I would like to see more joint projects. I mean, I don't even know if there are any. I would like to see joint projects between U.S. aid organizations and Chinese aid organizations. But I think there's another thing that's interesting, too. Let's say the United States chooses 50 countries that it's focusing on and it's helping develop. China is helping, you know, 50 or a company uh, countries and helping them develop and giving them bridges and whatever. Uh, the benefic the beneficiaries aren't just the people in those countries, but also the countries that China is helping develop add economic value to the global economic order and help the United States. And the countries that the United States is helping integrate into the global economic system are also helping China sell products, import and export. So it seems like aid is like one of those places like global warming, you know, global development aid and global warming where the United States and China seem like they should be perfectly well suited to be partners on. I, 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 I really hope that that is something we can see more of in the future. What do you, what do you think, as someone who worked with USAID, do you think it's possible for us to set aside other issues about national security and work together better in these fields? I think it's definitely possible, especially if you, if you keep in mind what is the sort of end goal, which is just we're all better off. And, and I think we're all better off when others are better off too. Going back to what you yeah, said. I mean, I also think, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I also think it's a really interesting, the United States spends an enormous amount of money on international security apparatus. And so I think if the United States, if there were more countries that were better off, there would probably be less conflicts, fewer conflicts. I mean, I would have to prove that there would have to be an enormous body of research backing up that statement. But it does seem like people who are better are happier are less prone to conflict. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's you know uh, infantile. I don't know. I have. I, they would have to be an enormous body of research backing that up. But it does seem like if we could help out the developing world, there would be net less need for conflict. What do you think? I fully agree with that, and I think there's I, there's a whole genre of economics and peace theory 
backing that up. This is something that has been studied over and over and over and over. Uh, they've said that, hey, when people have uh, have have jobs and businesses and uh, things are going good, there's bread on the table, they aren't going to be as violent. Uh, there's a there's a candidate in America 30 years ago. He became president. Uh, Bill Clinton, he had this saying tacked up in his campaign uh, war room, as it were, his headquarters. It said, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, if, you, if you can if you can work on the economy, a lot of people will be happy. And and I don't think the implications in his campaign were really about revolt or war or anything. But I think you know there's there's a big case of people who have jobs are not usually marching uh, on the streets and not really trying to take over other countries and instigate conflicts or anything like that. I think very last question. I have, I have one last question. We're almost out of time. You travel a lot internationally. I know. How many? Before I ask the question, how many countries have you been to? Oh, too many. I have to check the passport. I have to have to look through the, all the different passports and say ballpark. Okay. Ballpark. Um, several, several dozen. I, I several, I, several I, dozen. Wow. I okay. could not even right. begin to tell you. For yeah. Americans who may be listening to this and they're like, oh, I want to I want to move abroad or I want to travel abroad, but they never they, they, they haven't got up the courage maybe yet. Or, you know, it, it seems like an overwhelming task. What would you say to them? I think it will seem overwhelming. And then in retrospect, you'll think, why didn't I do this sooner? <laughs> uh, I don't know if the world I don't know if the world is great. I can't tell you that. But I do think it is good. I think that there are good people wherever you go. There, uh, there's good food wherever you go. I'll tell you that right now. You're gonna eat well. What wh whichever country you're in, there's some good food, um, and there's kind people. Um, and I think for Americans specifically who are thinking about going to China to visit or to live, China is such a big country. Um, there's so many beautiful. Places I talked about Yosemite, Yellowstone, and Zion in the U.S., but China has Changjiajie. I think that's one place I talked to you about before. Of just it is so surreal. You go there and you think you have actually fallen asleep and you're dreaming because it is so different from. Well, it's very different from Iowa City, Iowa. I'll put it that way. <laughs> sure. All right. Thank you so much for your time. Um, uh, where can we find you if we if people want to follow your work? Um, you can follow. You can find me uh, on LinkedIn, just under Jeremiah Anthony. I post stuff about the U.S. and China occasionally. Um, I should post more stuff about the U.S. and China because I think, to no surprise here, it's a very special relationship and one that should be improved on. Um, but then also, if you're in China, I hope you will find me soon. Uh, eating some good uh, skewers on a in, in specifically the Nanjing streets. I'd love, I'd love for Chinese friends to see me there because I would like to be there. All right, thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Hello. Hello.